The gospel reading today is taken from uh, the book of Mark, uh, chapter 10, verses 23 to 31. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And his disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left home or house uh, <clears throat> or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The word of the Lord. I got a secret to share with you this morning about one of my rather guilty pleasures, don't worry, nothing horrible. I guess it's your perspective on that, but I grew up watching professional wrestling on Saturday afternoon in Charlotte. Now these were the ancient days when we had black and white televisions and Charlotte had no professional sports teams, hardly any teams at all. And even then there really weren't, there, were, there just wasn't very much sports on television. But every Saturday afternoon, Championship wrestling came on, and I would watch it. And I found it to be very entertaining, especially because of its very strange cast of characters. These very, very interesting people who did this sport. Now, growing up a Southern, I've always loved gothic drama, played out through various storylines. And that's what they did in the wrestling world. They would create these storylines that were ridiculous, ridiculously hyperbolic. Hyper they were hilarious. But I have to admit, I enjoyed them. In fact, I am absolutely positive that the wrestling organizations, even to this day, must have hired theologians to write those storylines. I really believe that. Because so many of them represent quasi-religious themes. That ancient duality, good versus evil, right versus wrong. And you can go on and on and on. And I enjoyed these stories. In fact, one of my favorite storylines, one of my favorite examples, happened in 1996 when the wrestling organization in Atlanta, Georgia, on Ted Turner's network, created a very clever Storyline. I still remember it really quite. In a storyline, almost an exact copy of Satan's Rebellion in Milton's Paradise Lost, I swear they had to have taken it from there. A group of renegade and evil wrestlers attempted to take over the established order in the wrestling world. And this group even had a fallen angel, Hulk. Bogan. Yeah. Who went from being the ultimate good guy, the great hero, to the ultimate heel. Heel is what they call the bad men and women in wrestling. And he became kind of the ultimate heel. He traded his brightly colored yellow spandex for gang-like attire and insignias. Now what is this group of conspirators these insurgents, what did they call themselves? Did they call themselves the gang? Did they call themselves the rebellion? 
Did they call themselves the Confederacy? No, that's too little for wrestling, for the world of professional wrestling. They declared themselves the NWO, the New World Order. A New World Order that not only would take over the rest, but according to them, would take over the world. <laughs> and I did have my doubts about that. I really did. But sometimes, something ridiculous like that can actually reveal deeper realities and sometimes profound truths. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal in the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle, the birds of the air, and to every animal of the field. This passage comes from what we call the second creation story. In the first creation story, we see God ordering creation, ordering the universe. There's even a numerical order, seven days. Ordering, bringing things to order, creating things in a place for them to be, where they could sustain and support and create life. Then in the second creation, we see God give that very ability to the human beings that he created. Think about that. The human's ability to bring order to both the created universe, to bring order to our own lives, to name things, to title things, was the very definition of what it meant to be created in the image of God. Only we have that ability. To order things, to put things into an order. To organize them. Put things together. But of course, as we know from the story from Genesis and onward, it did not take us long to take the image of God in which we were made and to form it, pervert it, into a chaotic reflection of our own will to power. So we did over and over and over again. We're still doing it. Human culture has always been plagued by those who have decided to recreate the world in their own image, to bring about a new world order, and this has done nothing but cause suffering time and time again. You know what I'm talking about? The third right. Hitler's new world Stalinism, Stalin's new world order. Mao's cultural revolution. The Khmer Rouge, the new world order in Cambodia. Now these were just the new world orders that were created just in the 20th century alone. And killed countless millions of people, women, men, children, killed by God and created for the sake of their new order. You don't have to, to have drama. You don't have to have a dramatic storyline or, or gothic, gothic drama to, 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 to see the, the horror. And that had been going on for 2,000 years. In fact, in the time of Christ, if you will recall, it was Rome that had successfully created their new world order. A new world order built upon the cult of a god emperor and empowered by a corrupt system of wealth. Rome was basically a pyramid scheme. Pyramids. Everything flowed from the bottom to the top, and the emperor, the god, sat on the emperor's throne and gathered all the wealth along with the city. Wow. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? It does. This misuse of wealth and resources did not, unfortunately, just characterize Rome, 
but to some degree the culture of first century Israel, the culture in which Jesus was raised, the culture he taught and spoke to and came to redeem. In fact, Israel intersected with Rome in their mutual belief in the power of wealth. And the belief of Israel in that power of wealth warped the moral order of Israel's religion and the law. It warped them. To some degree, it destroyed them. You know what I'm talking about? If you were born infirm, if you were born poor, if you were born with a disease, if you were born with, and you into family problems, anything bad. That was God's judgment upon you. For your relatives. God hated you. You know, we've talked about this before. But if you were born wealthy and healthy, or you had born into circumstances that gave you power, or gave you the good things, as we would say, of life, that was a sign of God's endorsement upon you. That was a sign of your personal righteousness. A guarantee that you were okay in the eyes of God. How, what would it be like to live In our passage from Mark, by the way, this passage takes place, what we just heard read, takes place just after, right after, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus. We know the story. Comes to Jesus asking, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, you must sell all you have and follow me. And we know then that this young man, or if he was young, and just this rich ruler, he walks away sad because, according to Mark, he had much wealth. He had many things. Maybe he felt that walking away from Jesus or walking with Jesus would be something equivalent to walking away from God. That's what they taught. That's what they believed. Becoming poor? Giving up God's signs of blessing? You don't think that. What Jesus said to his followers, who were really, really perplexed about this, they did not understand why Jesus said, it's harder for the rich to get into the kingdom than for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. They just didn't get that. But what he was saying is that the corrupted morality of the institutional religion of Israel does not have the final say about who is righteous and who isn't, about who is right and who is wrong, about who is saved and who is not. Only God that's what Jesus was saying. This wasn't a lesson about the wealth. It was a lesson about love. And again, this astounds and perplexes his followers. This is not the world as they understand it. This turns everything around. They just don't get it. Peter expands upon the concept, however. Peter's trying to get it, and in doing so, this is what he says to Jesus. Look, we've left everything in front of Think we've done this. To which Christ not only affirms the cost of discipleship, that there is a cost, but concludes his lesson to it with literally an astonishing new understanding of God and the world. Many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Now notice he didn't say that all who are first will be last. Nor all who are last will be first. He didn't say that. He said many. Keep that in mind. But what a startling thing that was for Christ's followers to hear. This was indeed a true new world order, the real thing, wherein faith in God meant absolute trust. And trust in God's relationship with humanity 
I trust that the will of God is working in this world and that no matter what we go through, the will of God is still working in our lives. What's the first thing we do when we hit bad times? We all do. I guarantee you there are millions of folks in Indonesia and hundreds of thousands of folks in Florida and in the South this morning going, why did God do this to me? What did I do wrong? And we know the answer. You did the same wrong thing that we all do, including we who did not get hit by a hurricane. No different. God loves you. That's the, that's what is really tough, isn't it? That's what is really tough to be a Christian, to be a believer. And yet, this is what Jesus said last week. Last week we celebrated, remember, World Communion Sunday. And what was the message of World Communion Sunday? I shared it with you. It was that God, Jesus, God's Son, had established a new world. The kingdom of God. The reign of God. And here we see, almost like another Genesis, we see Jesus ordering that new world. Putting it into order. But it's not the order that we expect for his followers. The first will be last. The last will be first. Why did he say that? <coughs> what does he mean? What is this truth? New world order. Well, in the old world, the old world order, before Jesus came, life was basically a lottery. It was a lottery. Wherein we were dependent upon what? Fate. And whatever life makes of us. That's what the old world was. In the new world order, given to us the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, life becomes not a lottery, but a clear certainty in which God is dependable no matter the circumstances. God is dependable no matter the circumstances. The new world order of the reign of God means we are no longer subject to what life makes of us, but what we make life. Not for our sakes, but for our Lord and our God and our Savior. So when the bad times come, our only, we have only one question. Lord, what do you want me to learn and what do you want me to do? How can I respond as, a, as someone who loves you to this circumstance? As difficult as it is. How can I respond to the circumstance of my brother or my sister or my neighbor or my friend or the stranger across the borders and the boundaries of the world? What, Lord, do I need to do in your new world to be faithful? And that is why you and I are here this morning. We are here to make something of life. Not for ourselves, but for the spiritual kingdom which we serve. For the Christ whom we love. In Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, one of the characters says this. Listen carefully. The mystery of human existence lies not just in staying alive, but in finding something to live for. Is that not true? Finding something to live for. And if we live in and for the old world order, guess what's going to happen? We know it's going to happen. Because the old world order is not going to save us. No matter how much money we got, how much power we have, how great things are, things change.
storms come. People struggle. And you can't buy your way out of debt. Not yet. Just doesn't happen. But we don't have to find that which to live for. We who follow Christ, we don't have to find that which to live for because we know what Christ died for. The world. Us. Everything. And a new world order built upon mercy and compassion and worship and love. Hulk Hogan's New World Order storyline, by the way, eventually ended. It, the New World Order went away. He, he did not take over the world in his minions. And new storylines were begun. And they're still going on today. Storylines change, but they go on. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ started a storyline that has not changed. And we are the story. We're the story. The story runs through us, through our hands and our hearts and our minds. The story is Christ, but it's our story. And it is Christ who lives through the love that we share with others. When people see the new world order built upon love and mercy and compassion and justice, they want to join. I'm not the least bit worried about Christianity going away. Not the least. It's still the new world order that goes on and on until kingdom come. 